Well, here we... They booby-trapped me with a cat claw. Nothing quite says thank you for bankrupting yourself for my life-saving surgery like a cat claw in the arse at 9am. I'm gonna show her because none of these books have cats in them. Hi guys, it's Leanne and today we're talking about me because I am important and I am smart although not apparently smart enough to not film in front of the hideous gap on the bookshelves don't worry it is not going to be empty for very long I'm literally sitting surrounded by the judgment of all of the new books that I have bought and they're gonna judge me even more because in this video I'm almost exclusively talking about backlist titles today I'm gonna to tell you eight weirdly specific things that I like to read in books <laughs> Loads of people have been doing this recently and I was like, well, I'ma just hop on the back of that train. I can talk about me, right? How hard is it to make a list of things that I like? Turns out it was actually, it was actually harder than I thought. Hmm. Talking about yourself sounds like great fun until you actually have to talk about yourself and then not so much. But nevertheless, here we go. We shall give it a try. And if you've been on my channel for a little while, please join me and play a game with me. I want to know how many of these weirdly specific Leanne things you guessed before I get to the end of the video, so leave it in the comments below. First up on my list, predictably, is place as character. One of my absolute favourite things in books is if the author can make me feel like the setting is as important as the people. I think what most people think about when they think about place as character is buildings, for example Manderley and Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier where our nameless protagonist marries into this like old English country estate and she thinks her entire life is going to change and on the outside it's beautiful but everything's just a little bit off. The flowers are kind of taking over a little bit. Everything is a little bit darker and murkier than she thought that it was going to be and it feels like every object in the house has a backstory that is inaccessible to her. Like she will never be able to fully know this place that she's come to live. There's a wonderful scene in this book where the housekeeper tells our protagonist that she will never own the house, she'll never be the lady of the house, that the house is its own thing and that is just so accurate. When I think about Rebecca I think about Manderley, I don't immediately think about the characters even though the book is named after one of the characters. Also of course if we're going to talk about Place's character we need to talk about a haunted house novels which I am obsessed with. Literally quite obsessed. Like most of my horror shelf is haunted house novels but the one that everybody is sick of me going on about I am sure by this point is the upstairs room by Kate Murray Brown. This is about a family who moves into their dream fixer upper home in London. It's a middle terrace house, it's three stories high, everything is a little bit wrong with it. It has old wallpaper, one of the old owners has left a crap ton of just craggly, nasty, slightly mildewy furniture and right up in the attic in the very top room is the room that the children in the family used to sleep in and there are some mm, quite disturbing things written on the walls. They decide they're not going to use that room, they are going to work from the ground floor up, from their living quarters up and then the house starts to tell them that that's not necessarily what it wants. It doesn't want to be renovated. The house is quite happy the way that it is. And when I think about that novel, the first thing I think about is the staircase going up to that attic room. That is the first thing. And then the kitchen drawers, which is a whole other uh, thing. Mm. But Place's character doesn't just have to mean buildings, it can mean entire locations and one of the best examples that I have of this is The Lost Man by Jane Harper. This is a thriller novel about three brothers who have farmed a massive stretch of land like way, 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 way in the outback of Australia in a place 
where you know you have to take a plane to get to a city and you could drive literally for days before you actually hit a town a place that is so hot and so desperately claustrophobic that the code no matter whether you have years old rivalries with someone is that if they are in distress you stop because two minutes outside of your car and the elements could kill you. The way that the actual environment of that novel plays into the paranoia of the characters, the whole mystery in this novel surrounds why one of these brothers would have left a fully stocked ute with air conditioning and water and just walked out into the wilderness to die of heat and exposure. The whole psychology of this novel is so wrapped up in the idea that this landscape will kill you. It is out to kill you. It wants to return to what it was before and you existing is getting in the way. When an author can make you feel like an entire town like in Hex or an entire country like in Tangerine is a place that is living and breathing and thinking for itself and doesn't necessarily want to welcome you in, that is just it's amazing. And I mean, Place's character is not always unwelcoming, but I guess I kind of like it when it is. Next up on my list, and also another easy one for anyone playing the Leanne Likes bingo at home, is creepy child narrators. The only time I want children to be prevalent in a plot is in a middle grade novel where I'm rooting for them and there's magic and there's intrigue, or when they are a creepy, possibly sociopathic child narrator. When I say creepy child narrators, everyone always says to me, oh, like, and we need to talk about Kevin by Lionel Shriver, and I'm like, well, yes, but also there are many other ways that creepy children crawl into my books. For example, one of my favourites is Reasons She Goes to the Wood by Deborah K. Davies. In this book, we have a little girl called Pearl who, at the beginning of the novel, we are told, runs away at every opportunity she gets to be in the woods. She doesn't want to be with people, she just wants to be on her own in the wilderness. And at first you're kind of thinking, oh that's a shame, she obviously isn't very well adjusted, she doesn't get on with her family and, you know, potentially she doesn't really have any friends. And then you peel back another layer of the novel and you're like, oh, okay. Mm, maybe she doesn't have friends because of those specific behaviours which are problematic. Then you peel away another layer and you're like, oh, those, mm, those behaviours are not just problematic, child. And it just keeps going. It is like a big rotten onion with pearl at the centre. Next up, we have a book that I literally just talked about in my last video, so I won't go on about it too much here. But that is Dead Girls by Abigail Tartell. And this features a little girl called Thera, who again, at the beginning of the novel, we just see as this quite innocent little girl growing up in the 90s whose best friend has been murdered and she has decided that the adults just don't care as much as she does. And so she is going to, against all odds, find the murderer. But as we get further and further into Thera's theories and the way that her mind works, we start to realise that actually maybe Thera is not entirely okay. Maybe she's not just an average little girl and then one day Thera starts talking to herself apparently in the novel and the whole thing just goes off a cliff and you're in an entirely new place and I'm like oh my eyes have been opened and for the whole second half of the novel you're like I did not know this girl at all, I was fooled, I my Thera's freaking great. And finally for creepy child narrators a book which nobody lists on these lists, like nobody says that this particular series has a creepy child narrator and to that I say what book are you reading? This is Sweetness at the Bottom of the Pie by Alan Bradley and it is the first book in the Flavia de Luce Mysteries series which is, I guess you could call a cosy mystery series. This is set in the 1950s where one father is trying to raise three daughters on a slightly crumbling old English estate which has massively changed since the war and essentially somebody is found dead in the cabbage patch and the father is accused. So that's the mystery but the creepy thing is not the mystery, the creepy thing is freaking Flavia. At the start of this novel her sisters lock her in a cupboard because they're like eh, we can do that you're little and we don't like you and she's literally 
quite happy to sit in the cupboard because she's plotting their murder. She's described as an aspiring chemist, but she's freaking not. She's an aspiring poisoner. She's obsessed with poisons. She's obsessed with murder. She's obsessed with knowing how it works. So sure, these are cosy mysteries, but only if you enjoy homicidal children. Next up on my list, we have novels that play with time. I am not talking here about novels that are set partly in the past and partly in the present, like in the 1800s and in like the 2000s. That's not my particular joy. My particular joy is when a novel plays with time in a weird format that ends up really screwing with our heads and our perceptions of the novel. One of the best examples of this is All the Birds Singing by Evie Wilde. I am evangelical about this novel. I absolutely love it. It is... Pff, this book is about Jake. She lives on an extremely remote Scottish island with her dog named Dog and she is a sheep farmer. And at first I think everybody who's picked up this novel is like, okay, why are we, why are we here? What, what, what is going on? It turns out that Jake is in fact not Scottish, she is Australian, and that Jake is in fact not just quite happily sheep farming, she has run away from her past and that the sheep farming's not actually going that well because dead gutted sheep are turning up all over the place. And then once that hook is in, the next chapter of the novel then goes back in time, but it doesn't go back to like Jake when she's a little girl and tell her story through in a sort of chronological way that you would expect. It goes back to the horrible incident that caused her to run away in the first place. And both of the narratives work in opposite directions. So we're hearing about Jake in the present going forward and investigating these mysteries and then we're hearing about Jake's past but Jake's past is actually going backwards and it's investigating how she got to all of the stages that she's at later on in the novel and it sounds really complicated but it's so incredibly seamless. I'm just so impressed with this novel. Another book that I'm extremely passionate about and never talk about is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Now I think everybody who thinks about you know playing with time and Virginia Woolf will immediately go to Mrs Dalloway because of course that book is set primarily over one day whereas To the Lighthouse is told over one day and then mm, over a different gap of time. To the Lighthouse starts out with a family who run a boarding house and primarily the boarding house hosts artists but there's also some people who are just I guess trying to find themselves. The entire premise of the first half of this novel is literally just that the characters are trying to decide if they are going to boat to the lighthouse that day and if they are what they're taking with them and who's going with them and that is that's it that's it like very much like all of Virginia Woolf's books it is a very sort of stream of consciousness narrative where you're dumped into the heads of a lot of different people in very close succession. Reading this novel that takes place over the course of one slow day could seem like really claustrophobic and overdone but instead it constantly feels like it's holding you in place, like it's keeping you back almost from the horrible thing that you know is going to happen and when the secrets start to pour out at the end of the first half and you start realising who these people actually are that you've spent all this time with getting to know, it's genius. Next up at number four is my much beloved thriller trope of returning to a small town. Now don't roll your eyes at me. Everybody does that as soon as I tell them that I love this trope because it's so overdone in thrillers now, right? So many new series have started where it's the sole premise of the series and it's appeared in like so many standalones that it's almost like the toxic marriage thing. It's just omnipresent and you can't get away from it. But on this occasion, I do not care because I like it very freaking much. Okay, thank you. Yes. I will not talk about this for too long because I am self-aware that I am in the minority at this point. First up we have Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. This follows a newspaper reporter who is uh, a little bit down on her luck. She's mostly been taken under the wing of the editor at the paper because he particularly trusts her and he's taken a shine to her but she's not great with deadlines. She's just not great at all. 
really. And then her editor calls her in one morning and tells her that there has been a murder in her very small town and he wants her to go back and cover it, not just as a murder investigation but also as like a human interest story. It means that she has to go back to this cloying southern town with her overbearing mother and her family that she absolutely does not speak to at any other time in her life and she immediately feels parts of her that she's worked on for so many years receding and turning back into the like the little girl who nobody listens to and it's this is a novel that you will fly through but you will also really feel like you need a shower afterwards and of course the only person who was ever going to appear on this list <laughs> twice was Jane Harper because we also have The Dry which is about Aaron Falk. He is actually a fraud investigator, he is not a murder investigator and he goes back to his small town for the funeral of his childhood best friend and his entire family, his wife and small children who he is accused of having murdered in a murder suicide. When Aaron gets there he really just wants to get through the funeral and get out. His father got him out many 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 years ago and he never intended to go back. But now that he's there, hmm, people have opinions and they know that he is a police officer and they want him to investigate. Again, it's small town, it's claustrophobic, everybody knows everybody, you know that there's secrets that he only knows one half of and it's just great, okay? Just sue me. I love this trope. Next up at number five is found families and I know this will resonate with an awful lot of you. The term found family really originates in the LGBTQI++ community and talks about when we are unable to be our full selves with the people who are our given family and so we craft our own family of other queer voices and other people who represent things that we really believe in. But the whole principle of this term is inclusivity. It's making your world something that you want it to be and so I consider it to be very elastic and I use it to talk about all books, not just books that include queer families. In saying that though, one of my favourite examples of found families in novels actually has a ton of diverse representation across like a whole host of different spectrums and that is of course The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. This is a sci-fi novel which takes place mostly on a ship called the Wayfarer which is a contracting vessel it literally punches holes in the universe to make wormholes at either end and at the very beginning one of our characters basically posts herself across space in stasis to join this crew that she's never met before because she answered an advert and it's as far away from her real life as she can possibly get and there she meets a very motley crew of very 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 different people uh, not just humanoids also but aliens who are not just humanoid in form which just makes me very happy there's interspecies romances there's polyamory there's so many different things in this novel that our character comes to grips with as we go through and it's just perfect. Another example that I never ever hear anybody talking about and in fact this series just doesn't get enough love is the Lady Trent memoir series by Marie Brennan. This is the second book in the series. The first one is A Natural History of Dragons but I've grabbed the second one because I think it's really in the second one that the found family aspect of it comes to the fore. This is a fantasy series set in a world that I think is most closely linked to Jane Austen's England and in fact I do tell people who like classics and want a fantasy recommendation that this would be a great place to start. This series is very sort of what Lizzie Bennet would have been able to do if she was interested in studying dragons. It's about Isabella who grows up in a world where it is not acceptable for young ladies to study dragons or become natural historians. That is definitely the realms of men and she decides that's not good enough for her. She wants to be the person who goes out there and works out how dragons tick in the natural world and she is going to do it by hook or by crook and throughout the first novel we see her really being set up to be able to do that to be able to do her research and then in the second novel in the rest of the series 
we see her gathering together this cast of people who she doesn't always necessarily like. Sometimes she respects, sometimes it's circumstance that brings them together, sometimes it's money that brings them together. But eventually they all start to form these bonds that you can only describe as familial bonds. And then finally another great example of this is a contemporary, well I say it's a YA novel but I feel like it's only just a YA novel and that is The Nowhere Girls by Amy Reid. This is a novel about Grace who moves to a small town after mm, her mother takes a new job but her mother takes a new job because things have happened in their old town to Grace and she discovers that she's actually living in the house of a girl who was run out of town because she accused someone on the football team of rape and in this new school Grace finds a group of girls who are the nowhere girls who just don't belong anywhere else and they all of them come together and share these hideous stories of being abused and oppressed and having their personhood taken away by men, the men that run their town, the men that run the football programme, the men that are in sports, the boys that are in school who think that they have entitlement to their bodies and their voices come together and create this like greater whole than themselves and it's just amazing and heart-wrenching and please make sure that you are in the right place for it before you read this book because it's really impactful but the kind of family that these girls make is drawn together by horrific circumstance that could easily make them uh, be oppositional with each other or do the my suffering is worse than your suffering thing and instead it knits them together and they make this beautiful sisterhood that just oh. I want to read this novel again right now but I don't think my heart can take it in 2020. So that's it, that is a completely non-comprehensive list of some of the things that I love the most in books. Let me know if you were playing Leanne Likes Bingo, how many of those you guessed and how many of the books that I mentioned did you expect to see. If you have read any of those books and loved them I would love to hear about it in the comments and of course if you read any of those books and you completely disagree with me or any of my specifically and things that you absolutely hate I want to hear about that too because opinions live here and I promise there will be a book haul which will fill this unsightly gap at some point in the very near future okay okay so until next time guys if you enjoyed this video please consider liking and subscribing also if you would like some bonus content from me if you would like more of my face my patreon links are down below and I will speak to you guys soon bye you woke up then did you? Did you want to be in the video? Is my lipstick stinky? <laughs> Denied kisses. I mean, you're just kind of in the corner of the frame here, little guy. What's your plan?